Well, I'd send the Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and uh, thank you, Senator Collins, for I suppose making making my speech easier and, and uh, having spent the last seven or eight minutes outlining the history of the Greens' uh, engagement, very important engagement on this issue uh, here in this chamber. Uh, actually, we have raised the issue prior to 2010. Uh, Senator Bob Brown, uh, my predecessor, has raised this previously. It's been a long crusade for us to try and get a federal ICAC and get better scrutiny uh, of uh, parliamentary processes. And I'll get to those exact processes uh, in a minute. And I'm certainly encouraged to hear Senator Collins say that this uh, potentially is a, uh, is a junction or a fork in the road for this chamber where we may get support from uh, the Labor Party to actually put in place a process now. Um, really, uh, it's about priorities. Um, as Senator Collins has highlighted, uh, this has been brought to this uh, chamber twice. Uh, in the form of legislation. It's been referred off to committee, yet uh, nearly five years later uh, we've yet to have any significant movement at all on the establishment of a federal body. And Of course it has to be done the right way. Uh, all the concerns that were raised by Senator Collins uh, are justified and valid, uh, but we've been debating this for a long time. Uh, and It's time that we actually did set up this body uh, in line with a suite of other measures, which I also agree with. And, uh, and we'll touch on in a minute. Um, I suppose I'd, I'd like to just uh, remind you, uh, Acting Deputy President, of a uh, quote from one of my favourite Australian authors, uh, David Gregory Roberts, where he says, the only thing more ruthless and cynical than the business of big politics is the politics of big business. And when the two come together, you have the perfect storm. And what he means about the business of big politics is quite simple. It's about getting political parties elected. It's about uh, putting themselves uh, and the interests of their party ahead uh, and making sure that at polling day that they hold on to power or they seize power. Uh, the politics of big business is also pretty simple. Uh, it's about getting what they want and getting uh, deliverables and outcomes for their shareholders. Uh, nobody, uh, nobody would dispute that. Uh, we get visited by lobbyists in this in this uh, building uh, every day, all day. Uh, they're, they're here to uh, look after their shareholders, their stakeholders uh, unashamedly. It's not just business lobbyists, it's also unions, it's also environment groups. And these are often referred to uh, in pretty well established theory as, as special interests, and sometimes they're also called vested interests. Um, and I have spoken on this uh, at least four or five times in, in speeches since I've been in the Senate, which has only been two years. And um, I was quite chuffed when I got a, uh, an email from uh, an American couple who'd been travelling in Australia and they were driving their RV and they must have had the uh, parliament on the radio, uh, probably for want of knowing what a better channel might be, but nevertheless. And they heard the speech that I was giving on this and contacted me when they got back to Florida. And he said that their, uh, their local uh, community group, uh, it was a church group, had been talking about this issue recently and he pointed me. Uh, this gentleman uh, to a couple of uh, reports, which I which I've since read uh, with great interest. One was talking about the illusion of participatory democracy, and that is when we have a democracy, we go to elections, uh, individual voters, if they turn up, uh, which of course they should in this country, unlike his country, um, that they're the best informed they can possibly be on critical issues. But of course, most voters go to elections with a huge array of issues in their minds. Some may stick out more than others. Or sadly, uh, many also go to polling booths uh, with very little understanding of what's going on around them or real interest necessarily in how they're going to vote or what's going on around them. However, uh, within that same democracy, we have these special interests that are highly organised, highly resourced and highly motivated uh, with a whole range of uh, a whole, range, a whole arsenal or uh, set of tools in their toolkit that they can employ to get the outcomes that they want. And this is why he talked about the illusion of participatory democracy. We actually think that we run this country when we vote in governments, but actually what goes on behind the scenes in terms of uh, lobbying and lobbying, uh, you know, whether it be ministers, whether it be senators, whether it be individual MPs, is actually what determines parliamentary outcome legislation and uh, government decisions. Um, he, uh, this gentleman, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't name him because I haven't asked his permission, but he, uh, he referred me to a report uh, written by Harvard University, it was only published last year, um, by a, uh, an author called uh, Professor William English. And the title of the report was, and it's now a book, 
That's uh, institutional corruption and the crisis of liberal democracy. And uh, what uh, William English goes on to write about is he has two key recommendations. He basically says that um, there's these corrupting tendencies in democracies. Just democracy is the best system we've got, but unfortunately, uh, it's uh, it's, it's subject to corrupting influences, the key one being uh, it's, easily, it's easily corrupted by rent-seeking interests. And rent-seeking interests, just for the record, are the same thing as special interest and vested interest. But in the case specifically of rent-seeking, we're dealing with businesses who are looking to protect their profits uh, or actually grow their businesses. Um, and he comes to a, a, two conclusions. The only two ways that in a liberal democracy like ours the only two ways that we can actually prevent this corruption of our democracy uh, is, first and foremost, to put in place substantial investigative efforts that uncover and communicate abuses of democracy. And of course, he goes on to talk a lot more about uh, these, these special interests and the fact that really our democracies are easily hijacked by our rent-seeking uh, rent interests. Um, and it really it raises the question. When you look at corporate donations, uh, business, I'm talking specifically here of rent seeking interests, businesses, it raises the question of um, it would be questionable for any corporation to act against the interests of shareholders and put out money, as in, in terms of political donations, if it didn't think it was going to get a good return on that investment. So it's a simple question why do corporations give money to political parties? And sometimes they give money to uh, both, both the major parties. It's not just the, the current government, the Liberal Party here. Um, why do they give uh, money to, gov to governments and to political parties? You'd have to draw the, uh, the fairly obvious conclusion that they want something in return. They want the influence in return. And this, um, this issue has been very, very near, and, near and dear to my heart because in Tasmania, um, and my path to standing here in the Senate today has come through a, a very large and decade-long campaign uh, against a, uh, a polluting pulp mill in my backyard in the Tamar Valley uh, and the ocean where I, where I surf and, and recreate. And um, it's, a, it's way too much to even fit into 20 minutes. And I've talked a lot about it in my uh, opening speech to, to the Senate. Um, but the issue of political donations to the federal government during this campaign was a very hot topic in Tasmania. It was covered extensively by the media. Uh, there's been a lot of literature written on it. There's been entire books written uh, about uh, the corruption or perceived corruption around the Guns Pulp Mill, which took years to assess, went through all sorts of uh, processes, including a corrupted process, was pulled out of the state government assessment, was rammed through parliament. Parliament became the planning body. Uh, and then, of course, it went to federal parliament for approval. And uh, I just wanted to go through some information here uh, on uh, an example of what a federal ICAT could look at. And a very real example, uh, Senator Canavan, Canavan uh, talked earlier, there's no evidence that he can see that we need a federal ICAC. Well, I'd actually ask him to have a look at the, uh, the history and the background in the last decade surrounding the Guns Limited, Guns Limited pulp mill and the processes around that. So guns donations to the major parties have long this is, from the, this is from The Australian, uh, dated by Matthew Denholm, who's a very good journalist, uh, dated October 10, 2007. Okay. Guns donations to the major parties have long been contentious in Tasmania. The company gave $70,000 to both the State Division of the Liberal Party and the Liberal-linked Free Enterprise Foundation between November 2004 and April 2005. Now, just for note, I understand that the Free Enterprise Foundation and Senator Brandis, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest legal minds in the country I've, I've heard today or have read today, uh, you'd be able to point out to me if this was incorrect, is currently the subject of the New South Wales ICAC uh, for uh, payments relating to property developments in uh, the New South Wales Liberal Party. So it's the same, the same uh, foundation that received funds from, uh, to, from guns federally in 2004-2005. Now, this followed the 2004 federal election in which Mr Howard announced the continuation of old growth logging and a far more modest forest policy protection policy than was put forward by the then Labor leader Mark Latham. Uh, 
Fascinating time in history. Once again, no time to cover it today, but anyone who is interested, I would uh, thoroughly recommend reading about Mr Latham's uh, lightning trip down to Tasmania with a visit with Bob Brown to the old growth forests and uh, what, what, what followed afterwards. Former state Liberal leader, Bob Cheek, and he's, he outlines this uh, accusation in his book, uh, Cheeky, uh, The Confessions of a Ferret Salesman, who uh, Senator Bushby has very possibly read, uh, claims that in the lead up to the 2002 state election, he was the, uh, the leader of the Liberal Party in Tasmania. Don't ask me about the ferrets acting deputy president, but he, was, he actually was a ferret salesman before he went into politics. That's a, that, is, that is the truth. He claims, he claims, Senator Brandis, that Gunn's executive, John Gay, showed him two cheques. One, a guaranteed donation for $10,000, and another for $20,000 to come if I locked in the right answer to the question. And the question was, will you continue to support the existing forestry policy, which of course is about access to our old growth forests? Now, it's, uh, it's, it's gone down in infamy that uh, Mark Latham wanted to shut down old growth logging, and in the end, uh, John Howard was quite happy to uh, keep that open to uh, potentially, uh, and, and certainly at the time, the uh, idea that a world-class pulp mill would be built in the Tamar Valley and four to five million tonnes of native forest per annum would be fed into that pulp mill uh, over the life of the project, 20, 30 years. We're talking about most of our uh, old growth forests that would be left in the state would have been fed into this monster if it had gone ahead. Um, now, uh, further down the track, where we had the federal approval of this project, um, which uh, the Liberal Party were also in government at that time as well, um, Timber Company Guns Limited donated $56,000 to the Liberal Party in the weeks after the Howard government gave conditional approval for the company's $2.2 billion Tasmanian pulp mill. Uh, annual political donation returns released by the Australian Electoral Commission yesterday revealed Guns donated $64,750 to the National and Tasmanian divisions of the Liberal Party in that financial year 2007-2008. Now, interestingly enough, of this, 56,700 was donated to the Liberals in the time between then Environment Minister Malcolm Turnbull's conditional approval on October 4, 2007 and the federal election November 24th of that year. The donations were made, and this is the interesting part, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President, the, the donations were made in six payments ranging from $900 prior to the approval on October 12th to $25,000 on November the 13th. Uh, so these payments were staged, trickled in, and they increased in value after the approval going into the election. And my predecessor, uh, Senator Brown, raised this in the chamber, and he said these, the funds raised serious concerns and questions about the influence of political donations at the time. You have to wonder why Guns gave not just one lump sum donation to the Federal Liberal Party between the announcement of the go-ahead for the Port Mill election, but a series of donations. Couldn't Guns make up their minds? Question mark for Hansard, or was there some flow of information between the party and the company? Uh, anyway, uh, that year, uh, you may also be interested to know, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, Labor received only $1,986 from guns, uh, and that was donated on August 8, uh, 2007. So this, issue, so this issue is an example of the type of transparency that people would like to see these types of things investigated. And it may be that there's no findings of, uh, of corruption made in instances like this, but my point is an important one, Senator Brandis, through you, Chair, that this is what the public expect from us. They want to see increased transparency and they don't understand why a chamber full of politicians who could potentially all be investigated in the future are dragging their heels on trying to institute a body like a federal ICAC. To them, they see that as a conflict of interest. Quite an irony that we're, we're not happy to be put under further scrutiny ourselves and the actions of our parties. And that's not acceptable. Remember this illusion of participatory democracy. A lot of people uh, in this country and around the world are talking about the problems with our democracy in the sense that it is so easily hijacked. And I did want to talk a little bit about Tasmania because uh, all states uh, have a, a version uh, of, a, of an ICAC. In Tasmania, unfortunately, we have uh, an integrity commission 
uh, which has very limited powers. Now, one of the first things a new integrity commission did, uh, and it was only established in 2010, acting deputy president, was to investigate corruption around the Guns Pulp Mill. One of the first things it did. In a 2012 leaked report, the commission reports, uh, and this is about the construction of the Tamar Valley Pulp Mill, the commission presently lacks the legislative capacity to adequately investigate whether the government support the proposed pulp mill was improper. Now, it received confidential submissions, hundreds of confidential submissions, and I don't know the details of those submissions, but it lacked the ability to actually do this investigation. Uh, and there's a whole series of recommendations that the Tasmanian Greens, uh, currently led by Kim Booth, are trying to get much stronger teeth for this uh, Tasmanian Integrity Commission. But it really also raises these questions about whether we have uh, a role for a federal body that could also look at these instances like I just discussed. Now, um, it's been mentioned in the chamber already today by, uh, by uh, Senator Collins around FIFA. Now, it's my experience, and that, look, there's a difference between personal corruption and institutional corruption. Sometimes the line is blurred. The ICAC in New South Wales is looking at examples of, his, of personal corruption, where individual uh, politicians or public servants may have received inducements for favours. Institutional corruption is a lot harder to define. It's about these things like special interest theory, how, uh, how beholden are governments and politicians to the big end of town or to special interests. Um, but I am convinced from the FOFA uh, inquiry, which I was on with Senator Bushby through you, Chair, that the Australian Bankers Association uh, had a very clear statement that they had expected the government to deliver a watering down. And watering down is my words, that's not what they said, but they had expected to deliver changes to the FOFA regulations. Uh, it's all on Hansard. Um, Ms Tate gave that evidence at the Senate inquiry. Uh, and I asked why they hadn't changed their compliance systems in time for June 30th, and she said we, we do have an expectation that uh, prior to the last elections that these things would happen. They're the exact words she used. Now, what sort of deal was done between the government and the Australian Bankers Association, the big banks? I don't know. But when I look at and Senator Bushby, this is the this is this is all about through you, Chair. This is all about perception. This is about what the public think when they look at this. P following that. You, you rammed through, tried to get through legislation. When that failed, you changed, you brought in regulations before June 30th. You rushed them through on a Sunday afternoon so that they couldn't be scrutinised. Uh, you did a dirty deal with the Palmer Party to get your regulations up. Now you are trying to get your legislation through Parliament prior to the release of the Financial Services Inquiry, prior to the release of a sensitive report by ASIC very shortly into the same issues that FOFA was trying to address. It's it's clear to me that there is a rush on to get these changes to FOFA done. And I understand from my time in the inquiry it's because not only does it impact the sales-driven business models of the big financial services companies, it's also going to cost them hundreds of millions of dollars in compliance to meet the FOFA regulations by June 30. Now, to me, that's a very clear example where you, your government has chosen to, chose to side with big business, with the big end of town, uh, over the Seniors Australia, over Choice Australia, over other groups, because that's, 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 let's call it a deal. That's a deal that you did with the banks to get that done. And coincidentally, you were beneficiaries of large donations from the banks going into the federal election, uh, which occurred after these discussions with the Australian Bankers Association about delivering these outcomes on FOFA. So whichever way you look at it, you could say it's a coincidence. But to most average Australians who expect higher levels of transparency from their government, uh, they look at it and go, well, you delivered for the banks. That's a choice you've made. Uh, that is rent-seeking by anyone's books, if it's true, and I think it is. Uh, and it is, could also be viewed as institutional corruption. So these are the types of things that I think the Australian uh, voters, the Australian citizens, uh, expect to be addressed by a body, and uh, I won't go into the details, but certainly Senator Rianne has talked about the Canadian model, uh, and I agree with Senator Collins what was said earlier. These things need to be done properly and they need to be thoroughly investigated, but let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. We seem to have agreement from the Labor Party that we should now enter into this process to have a federal body. There's other things we can do around lobbyist registers, 
There's a whole, ser whole suite of things we can do to tighten this up. Let's not do it for ourselves. Let's do it for the Australian people. It's what they expect, and it will certainly, uh, it will certainly increase the confidence that they have in us as decision makers in this parliament, which they voted us into.